This week on Q&A, our guest is Judy Shelton, economist and Wall Street Journal contributor. Judy Shelton, the last time you were in this studio was April, around April the 9th, 1989, 20 years ago. <laughs> I have not seen you anywhere since then. What have you been doing for the last 20 years? Um, I guess I'm a hermit. I'm, I've still been thinking about all the things we probably talked about back then. And um, I think even back then I was mostly interested in issues like international monetary reform. I was probably working only on the Soviet Union, which turned into a special case of an economy gone bad. But um, I, my husband and I live on a farm, effectively, just the right distance from Washington, about an hour and 10 minutes. And so I like to dabble in the intellectual and the political and the academic. But I would say uh, my personality is to just hide away in my little office with my computer. And um, I'm not a big socialite type. We're going to show some of the past uh, interview that we did, but before we do that, let's go through some of the, just some of the basics. Where were you born? Los Angeles. Where did you go to school? In the Valley. So I'm really kind of the classic uh, Valley girl for sure, a uh, suburb of Los Angeles, San Fernando Valley. What kind of a family was it? Great, great family. I have a great family. Five kids. Um, mom, very traditional, wonderful, stayed at home, took care of five kids. I, I don't think I ever fully appreciated then what a huge job that is. I thought it was kind of glamorous that my dad was a businessman and went out the door with a briefcase. So I think I probably aspired more that route. And then you, I know you got a PhD from the University of Utah. Uh, what year was that? 81. Back off of that, where did you get your undergraduate degree? I went two years to UCLA. Then I became Miss Independent, left home, went to Portland State University, which I quickly found out when you're paying for your college yourself, then you just go where you can afford. And I started working, and probably that's when I got serious. It was the first time I took an economics course. From then on, I was a very serious student. I was offered a job at Payne Weber. That took me to Salt Lake City. I met my husband there. I continued and received my PhD in finance wrote a paper that some very kindly professor decided was good enough to submit on my behalf to a uh, competition. It won as best doctoral student paper. I ended up getting a, a postdoctoral fellowship uh, at Stanford at the Hoover Institution. What did you do there? I worked uh, for a gentleman who had named Martin Anderson. He had oh, just come famous. from the uh, Reagan administration. He gave me interesting projects without a lot of supervision, which was perfect for me. He had me researching international debt and finance statistics. And one of the most invaluable things I learned right away is probe and find out where those numbers come from. Is a country providing it? Is anyone overseeing it? How honest are the numbers? So, You were at Hoover for how long? Ten years. Live there, right there in Palo Alto no, area? No, no, not really, not really. Um, I ended up getting a fellowship to examine, in particular, Soviet statistics. I was looking at the world, but the ones that came up as most interesting numbers were on the Soviet Union. Gorbachev had just come into power in 1985. The United States and the West were suddenly making loans to the Soviet Union. New numbers were coming out about how much they were borrowing from the West. And I proposed to do a very, very boring, very dry study of the impact of Western capital on the Soviet economy. But as I was doing that, I started thinking, why is it that defense spending is costing US taxpayers so much money? And then we're turning around with our NATO partners and making loans to this Soviet economy and supplying goods that they might otherwise have to divert their own resources to making instead of building nuclear weapons against which we were paying a bundle to defend ourselves. So um, it all became sort of a policy issue. And um, so I ended up, this paper turned into a book with a very sensationalist title <laughs> called The Coming Soviet Crash that said, on paper, this country is going bankrupt. And then there were 
implications from that that even got me involved in defense issues. So it got interesting. I remember seeing you give a speech on this network back in 89. Since the topic before us is perestroika, who should pay for it? I thought it would be useful to take a few minutes to lay things out the way Gorbachev must be looking at them in terms of the economic and financial situation in the Soviet Union so that we have an overall feel for the requirements of perestroika, the cost, in the sense of what is needed to get it off the ground. And then we were doing the book show and I, we asked you to come and we visited for one hour uh, and I want to show the audience and you. Oh no. <laughs> several clips maybe before it's over. Uh, what you were talking about back then and the thing to keep in mind is that on November the 9th, 1989, it was the fall of the wall. So that was 20 years ago, but let's watch and see what you were saying back then. What do you think of the Soviet Union? I think that um, it's an idea that went wrong. Um, economically, I, I think it's doomed. Um, I, and I, I don't say that with glee. Uh, I've only been to the Soviet Union uh, on one occasion for a couple of weeks. Uh, I liked it very much. It was treated very nicely. Um, in some ways, I'm, I'm probably a, a closet uh, Slavophile. I like the Russian language. I work at it every day. I like um, Russian literature. So one problem with the book, or at least for me, is I've had um, the sense of people thinking that I, I want to see the Soviet Union collapse. I don't like the Soviet government. I don't like the Soviet government's emphasis on military strength as its claim to superpower status. I think it's misplaced. So, what do you I, think since then? What's, what's happened to the Soviet Union? Well, I still like Russia, and I like Russian literature, and I like the Russian people. I think what they found out was you cannot remain a viable country and suppress individual pursuit of prosperity or creativity or whatever it is people want to use their God-given talent life, liberty, happiness, you cannot subjugate that to what some greater government decides is important. And in the Soviet Union, they decided military strength was the most important. Second to that was infrastructure. They wanted to be independent and they wanted to be internally powerful and part of the control mechanism. And a very poor third were the people themselves. And I think it, it bred a sort of hopelessness that uh, I still think is, is the biggest problem of over, overreaching government. Have you been back? Yes, a few times. And now at the National Endowment for Democracy, uh, I specialize in pro-democracy projects in Russia. What is the National Endowment for Democracy? It's called NED, and the National Endowment for Democracy, NED, was started under President Reagan, but as a completely bipartisan, pro-democracy initiative. Uh, it is funded by Congress through the State Department, but it's independent of the State Department with an independent board. Who it's runs it? The board and our staff. And what we do is take grant money um, approximately um, 110 million a year and we have this year over a thousand projects but we never tell people in another country what they should be doing to have democratic institutions that is we think we think the best formula for people is democracy and that means free independent media um, fair elections honest elections um, rule of law, right to assemble. Um, the National Endowment is, is comprised really, well, there's four core groups and we give grants to them, but they represent the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, uh, Chamber of Commerce representing private entrepreneurship, and uh, Labor Solidarity Center representing uh, unions. Who nominated you for the board? I was asked by Vin Weber, who was the chairman. I don't know why we Who's chairman now? 
He, uh, well, it has just switched to uh, Richard Gephardt because they do, because it's so exquisitely politically balanced, um, they, they always make sure that there's a, the same number of Republicans and Democrats. Um, there's lots of congressmen and ambassadors who are on the board. But when the office, when the White House changes, they do change from chairman to vice chairman to reflect the party in power. Do they pay you? No. Do they pay the chairman? I don't think so, no. no. How, how big is the staff? The staff is, um, I think, about 120 or so, and they operate on a pretty thin budget. Basically, they receive the grants. People in other countries apply for grants. Countries all over the world, virtually every country, where there is some need to improve the democratic process. And um, uh, they've been very active in the Middle East. But they come to us. They can get on our website and apply for a grant. And then our staff make sure that they're legitimate and that they have the wherewithal to, to um, comply with the requirements. We're very transparent. But we do a lot of good in funding people who are willing to take the risk. And in some countries, it's, it's significant risk to fight for democracy. So anyone who's ever been cynical about democracy should talk to our grantees who thank us and who are willing to be harassed, put in jail, sometimes worse, because they demand what we have, and particularly those institutions, once again, a free independent media, the right to vote in an honest election, um, the right to assemble. Uh, they want to they have protests in most countries that are not allowed. Give us one example of what you would consider a success and how long you've been on the board. I've been on um, four years. I would say one of the great successes was Ukraine. Ukraine, the Orange Revolution, and in fact, uh, Russia very much resented the work of Ned. In, in Ned helped support the groups that became part of that movement, the Orange Revolution, who said, this will not stand. We know it was a fraudulent election, and they just, refused to leave the streets until there was a runoff, and that is when Viktor Yushchenko was elected. Uh, he's a man who, if you remember the toxins, his whole face was destroyed. He was not the favorite of Moscow, but he rose to uh, lead Ukraine, to head Ukraine toward NATO, toward the European Union. Now, things have been rough in Ukraine. Um, the economy has... Um, really spiral downward. Uh, it's a very difficult situation. They're on the border with Russia. But even though they've experienced real political difficulties and economic difficulties, I still think that they have said it's better to be independent and we will decide our own destiny. And probably even leaders who we might now say were too pro-Russian at one time, they likewise say, no, we may decide to move ahead with European Union integration. Here's more from our 20-year-old interview. Now, um, if I was going to advise the Soviet government from a financial point of view, what they could do to take part in the um, interna international financial system, monetary system, I would urge them to put their money where their mouth is, so to speak, and, and come up with a gold-backed ruble. I think that the Soviet Union's only claim to credibility with Western financial types is to provide collateral behind a currency. In fact, I think it would be a rather um, brilliant coup on their part to come out with a currency that they agree to redeem in gold because they have mythical holdings, uh, not, not mythical in the sense that they don't exist, but bankers' eyes just get round when they think of Soviet gold reserves. So there is this implicit assumption on our part that they do have something valuable, and clearly I think they're the world's second largest producer. They do have gold. What's happened to their gold and their ruble in the last uh, 20 years? Well, they should have done that. I have to say, I wish I had fought harder. Um, I went over with a Hoover team, a Stanford team, in 1991, uh, advising Boris Yeltsin. I was given the portfolio to recommend 
whether or not Russia could break free of the Soviet Union. It was that August that everything fell apart. And in fact, um, by December of 1991, the Soviet Union was no more. I think that the Soviet Union, or what the residual governments then, decided to go with the Big Bang Theory, and there was a Harvard approach. And um, the net result was, instead of solidifying the money first, they tried to do everything. And they ended up giving people a really bad taste for capitalism. The Russian people who were very hopeful under Yeltsin ended up thinking that this is a way for, for people who have access to the politically elite, the cronies of those in power, they'll get big rewards and the rest will suffer. So throughout the, um, the 90s, uh, Russia was really grasping with disaster. And it was only really when Putin came to power that Russia started um, making money because of oil and people started saying, you know, this is better. It's better to have a strong, tough leader. We're even, we're willing to give up some of those freedoms we thought were important, but it turned out we were, we were worse off under so-called capitalism. And I think even now, uh, if your currency has integrity, you can build on it. It's a foundation. And, uh, Russia ended up having a disaster in 1999 where the ruble lost a third of its value in a matter of a few weeks. There was a complete default and it, it put Russia on the lifeline to the IMF, which they also resented. And again, it just fueled kind of this permanent distrust of the West, which I think is why someone like Putin stays in power. You've mentioned the IMF a couple of times. What is it? The International Monetary Fund has a wonderful legacy. It was set up during World War II. Actually, the first draft laying it out was written by a guy named Harry Dexter White in the Treasury Department a week after Pearl Harbor was bombed. And the idea was to say, you know, in the 30s, because of the Depression, we had a breakdown of any kind of uh, international system. We had beggar thy neighbor, competitive depreciations of currencies, where everyone tried to make their currency cheap so they would get an advantage when they sold it in another country. Uh, we had protectionism. And um, in order to get the allies in Europe to feel like there was something worth fighting for, the U.S. decided, let's give people hope that if we get through this vicious war, there'll be something good to come to. We won't just go back to the 30s, where it was every man for himself and a depression. We'll show leadership. And so the IMF came out of that. The International Monetary Fund had one main job, and it was to have a stable international monetary system, fixed exchange rates among currencies. They would have to be fixed relative to the dollar, and the dollar would be convertible into gold at a fixed rate of $35 per ounce of gold. Any country in the world back up its currency with gold today? No, and this is why I now have real resentment of the International Monetary Fund, because when the U.S. went off that system under President Nixon in August of 1971, instead of fighting to maintain a stable monetary system or figure out how to get back to one, which is what I think the IMF should have sought to do, it waited a few years, kind of fumbled along, and then it accepted that. And now its attitude is any country can have any kind of exchange arrangement they want, floating, fixed, they can have a currency board, they can, they can piggyback and peg to another country's currency. The only thing they can't do is peg their money to gold. So it's not just a betrayal of the original idea, it's, it's almost perverse. They can't peg to gold. Meantime, the IMF sits on most, virtually all of the gold that was contributed from the beginning from countries who had to pay in gold or dollars to become a member of what was supposed to be a stable international monetary system. Uh, ben Weber, you mentioned earlier, my recollection is that Jack Kemp was a big gold 
supporter, and he had an outfit called Empower America, and that Vin Weber was involved with Empower America, and you were involved with Empower America. I was on that board. Um, very proud of that. Uh, Kemp was a visionary. There was recently a, an event in Washington to launch the Jack Kemp Foundation. It's very invigorating to see the people who were part of that movement, the supply side. Now we can proudly say supply side was something that brought economic growth. It was based on the wisdom of recognizing that the free market works because it's, it reflects the collective effort of individuals who use their talent and their intelligence to pursue their dream. And what you don't want to do is inhibit that. All, all entrepreneurs really want are good, solid rules, a, a solid foundation, and honest money, which is something Jack Kemp was willing to go to bat for, um, sound money, that to me is where you start. You're not your personal detractors, but people that would detract from or criticize what you're saying would say today that we are in the mess we're in today because of supply side economics, because of this thing that went on during the Reagan years that said, spend, 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 enjoy. Uh, you've heard it. The economic growth during the 80s completely turned us around from the stagflation, the, the stagnant growth and the inflation, the worst of all worlds that we had under President Carter. And in the 70s, it looked like our country was permanently in malaise or even going into decline, as if we'd just become, in a business model, kind of the cash cow, but our, our best days were behind us. What we learned under the Reagan administration was that the potential for economic growth is still there. I know it sounds hackneyed, but the American dream is still alive, and I think a universal one. People want to be successful. They want to be prosperous. It doesn't mean just material wealth. They just want to have the chance to pursue what matters to them and to define what matters to them. And the two big parts of the Reagan revolution were in monetary policy to, to stabilize it, to get rid of inflation. And under Paul Volcker, that's what we did. It took, it took a real squeezing out. It was very painful. But with high interest rates, we attracted a lot of foreign capital. He was following uh, Robert Mundell's ideas, Mundell Laffer, Art Laffer. These are the heroes of the supply side revolution. So on monetary, it was to have a stable, honest dollar. And um, in the fiscal realm, the idea was lower taxes, lower taxes, and give people a chance to be entrepreneurs before they get to a, an atlas shrugged point in their life where they, where they say it's not worth it. It's not worth it to be creative and take risks and go out there and be an entrepreneur. I really think when you lower taxes, you are finally recognizing the heroism of entrepreneurs. It's 20 years later, and remember back then, it was all about the Soviet Union. Here's yeah. another excerpt on what you were thinking then. Could you sense from visiting there for the short time that the, the people there are happy, unhappy? How would you compare them with the general mood of Americans? You know, that's a, um, that's a question that I think reflects human nature. I'm, I'm not sure that a um, highly consumerist society means greater personal happiness for an individual. Um, the people I met, happy enough. I think they had that, that uh, Russian characteristic of being resigned. I think they're much more passive than Americans. We're, we're so demanding. If something's not up to snuff, we call the manager. Uh, in the Soviet Union, they shrug it off. And if they get lucky, they're able to buy this or that. It's good fortune. But um, you, you wouldn't begin to see irritation of, uh, like you would in the United States. Have you seen any change in the Russian people since the wall came down? They've had a taste of freedom. There's still a certain 
resignation and they probably accept what's imposed on them much more readily than Americans. But I am so glad Americans don't have that trait. We do get mad. Thank, thank goodness. <laughs> we get mad and we fight back and we have a political system that allows us to say we don't like the way we're going and um, we're Americans and this is a government of the people, by the people, for the people, and we say we're the people and we really start asserting it. And uh, there, there's still a difference. The Russians don't quite believe it. But one thing I do think is universal is, is the entrepreneurial spirit. And, and it's not just about making money. I, I agree with what I said then. If you're resigned in, it's, in any society, it's not just because you can't necessarily be the wealthiest person. It's that you can't fulfill your own dreams. And in Russia, in the Soviet Union, it was that soul-killing aspect of living in a society where what you were going to do and where you were going to live was preset. It was central planning all the way. And, and the liveliness of a dynamic society like the U.S., I think, comes from a sense of well, we don't know exactly what's going to happen because I might just decide to go out and be this or that. I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to put together a plan. There's a sense of the possibility of being successful, however you define it, that I think is uh, the difference between being a caged animal where food is thrown to you predictably or saying, no, I'm going to live in the wild and I might just have to fend for myself. Um, if you like freedom, that's what you live for. And that, that's what I think is worth preserving or bringing, to, bringing as a power to bear in any society. Today, uh, 20 years later, this has been a huge consumer society. Um, you hear a lot of people complaining about service stinks wherever you go. In the U.S., you in mean? In the U.S. A lot of the institutions that we revered 20 years ago have failed miserably. Uh, all the airlines, almost all of them went broke. Uh, what, do you, what happened here then? I'd say wherever competition is limited, you're going to see a decline in service and value. It's competition. Uh, Adam Smith, who had a great sense of morality, he wrote about that as much as he did about how capitalism would work if the invisible hand sort of directed individuals to do things. He said that would ultimately give you the best society. And I think it's really true. Um, maybe it even seems selfish that people trying to enrich themselves cater to the demands of other people, but, but what else would we want? It's, it's people who are willing to, to set up a service business or produce something, and they're trying to please their fellow man, yes, because he's going to buy the product and they'll make a profit and that's how they'll, they'll do better economically. But it's also a society that pays attention to its fellow man because that person demands the best value for the lowest price and it brings to bear all of the forces of free markets and that's what I believe in. I think that comes closest to reflecting a system that individual humans can can thrive within. You have not. I've not seen you on television. Do you not do these shows for a reason? Well, I was especially pleased to do your show because I think it's it's nice to speak in depth. I appreciate that opportunity. I don't think I'm a good soundbite person because I'm likely to say something that. Um, Maybe it's taken the wrong way. I'm not sure, but, but do you I avoid them on purpose? Uh, I'm. I don't avoid them, but I don't often accept. I. I kind of. The Wall Street Journal, a blessed newspaper, has been very kind, uh, especially in the last couple of years, giving me a great forum to get ideas out there. But I'm. I like. I know we need strong political personalities, um, so you need people with charisma. But I think I'm much more the kind who um, is sitting in jeans and t-shirt and pounding away on my keyboard. And um, I don't even try to sell my ideas so much as I'll just slide it under the door. And if people 
like it. I'm happy to come in. I sometimes will come in and meet with senators at the Capitol and um, tell them my thoughts about the debt situation or the deficit or where we're going as far as the dollar. I love to do that, but more as a behind the scenes um, yeah, teacher, I guess. Not the doer, the teacher. So. David Walker, who used to run the GAO, Government Accountability Office, and now runs the Pete Peterson Foundation, says that we cannot grow out of the situation we're in now. It's is pretty that, frightening. Is that true? And if it is, it's a, is it the first time in our history? I never want to say we can't because we've been in terrible situations coming out of World War II. We had a lot heavier debt to gross domestic product ratio. Uh, we've had tough times before uh, where we're confronted with the, the loss of war um, financially as well as um, what it does to the spirit. Um, but I think the country is valiant, I want to say resilient, enough to come out of even this, but this is unprecedented spending, unending deficits, and what I consider an unconscionable accumulation of debt. It's the kind of debt that Thomas Jefferson said was the last thing he ever wanted to wish on this country, where the, the burden, the yoke on the necks of American citizens is set by government without really their express permission. I guess, I guess we give our implicit permission because we elect the people we do but it's a tremendous debt level. And I think at some point you can kill the goose that laid the golden egg. At some point, um, I can well imagine the creative, productive people who have brought tremendous profits and salaries and built factories and made other people wealthy. I can see an Atlas Shrug scenario where they all say, I'm going to uh, Galt's gulch. I'm dropping out. I'm going on strike because the country doesn't appreciate the risk I take on and how hard I work and the government takes me for granted. I can imagine people saying it was a great dream but I don't know if it's worth it for me and if enough people feel that way then the country has real problems. Which politicians have been the most consistent for you in your life that you have any respect for? Certainly Jack Kemp. Um, I like um, John Kyle of Arizona, Jim DeMint, South Carolina. Those people come to mind. I'm very pleased with Bob McDonnell. I've met him. The new governor, our new governor of, Virginia. of Virginia. Very pleased that he is talking about free enterprise and um, the American dream. I. I those would be the people who come to mind. Which economist, you know, in the Paul Volcker, Alan Greenspan uh, group do you respect the most? The greatest economist, the one for whom I have the most respect, is Robert Mundell. Where is he? Is he alive? Is he? he is a professor at Columbia. He won the Nobel Prize in 1999. He is the father of supply-side economics. He also has a magnificent castle in Siena, Italy with his wife, Valerie, and their young son. And um, every year, and I believe he's done this since 1971, since the dollar went off of gold, he has a fantastic gathering of economists from all over the world talking about how can we ever get back to a stable international monetary system. And he has people like Paul Volcker in attendance. I've met many central bankers and leaders of government there. And uh, so he's very much involved still in the future of the international monetary system. He's been consistent intellectually. And uh, he's very interested in China these days. He sees China as uh, coming on board, just as he supplied the intellectual groundwork for the creation of the, the euro, the European money. And uh, he now sees we could have some kind of a, um, a linkage between the euro, the dollar, and whatever China comes up with, some kind of a yuan that's convertible and uh, a stable currency. 
explain something. This is a simple thing. I mean, it's not simple explanation, I'm sure, but when the euro was created, and was, was that 10 years ago? Yes. There was a parody. Yeah. One dollar for one euro. Yeah. And then yeah. it even dipped <laughs> below where it was in the 80s on the euro side, and now it's a dollar fifty the other it, way around. Now that tells you something because the whole idea of floating rates was supposed to be a more stable system. And, um, and the whole idea of fighting protectionism is to eliminate tariffs. But because you have this huge area of the, the European Union and this huge area of the United States having variations of 50%, of more than 50% in that relatively limited time span, that tells you that the swing in currencies swamps the impact of a tariff of 5%, maybe 10%. When you have a swing of a currency of 50%, you have just made your competitors' products 50% more expensive, which is completely unfair if you really believe in a global marketplace and a level playing field. Uh, or you've given yourself an advantage, which is certainly on the scale of the Great Depression, when we called it beggar thy neighbor, these competitive devaluations, the U.S. now having a weak dollar, to me, is saying to the rest of the world, we don't care. We may be cheating because a weak dollar makes our products cheaper in your markets, but we're doing it. That's very unseemly for our country, such a wealthy country, to do that. One of the things amateurs like me don't know is who's making the money, and I assume somebody in this country with this weak dollar is benefiting greatly. Well, the problem is because there's no system, uh, money doesn't mean what it's supposed to mean. It's supposed to be a unit of account, a measure, an honest measure. It's supposed to be a store of value. Um, instead, it's become a game. The people who make money are speculators who bet on where the dollar is going to go relative to the euro or other currencies. And you have banks banks betting. Now banks have to be able to exchange money because they handle international trade, but the amount of money you would have to convert into another currency to carry out international trade is like less than 5% of the currency market. The foreign exchange market is huge and it's absolutely just a gamble of betting which way it's going to go. So banks get big profits from that, speculators get big profits, but what bothers me is that we've turned money into, into a lottery instead of money being a tool, and I think the most important tool for capitalism, which requires free markets, how do you interpret demand and supply for anything if you have this sliding measure of, of what its price is? It would be like having a ruler, and, and today an inch is this big, and tomorrow it might be like that. You can never have this reliable way to measure value. So how can free markets work when you don't have a unit of account that means the same and through time to everyone? You don't have that basic foundation up upon which price signals can then do their job and free markets can work. And you're married to a banker? I am, well, a former banker, a wonderful, a very brilliant finance and monetary intellect uh, who was a very successful banker, but who, lucky for me, got out of banking um, back in the early 80s and so is uh, kind of a fellow farmer. We both like to hang around the place and uh, go out and visit the cows, and uh, this morning he was up in a uh, tree stand watching deer. Didn't shoot any, but uh, I'm sure we'll end up having venison tonight. So <laughs> it's a different life. It's not a Washington life. You did spend time in Mexico, though. Yes, I taught at a, at a great school. It was a business school, a uh, graduate school of business called Dukes. It was started by a great man named Alfonso Romo, one of the billionaire, billionaires of Mexico, but more important, a man who whose grandfather was, um, was the president of Mexico, the first democratically elected president of Mexico in the 20s. He was assassinated 
but this man cares very much about the legacy of democracy and entrepreneurial capitalism. And this graduate school of business he set up in Monterey, Mexico, had all US and European faculty who he would fly in, you would take up residence at the school so that Mexico's cream of the crop MBA students didn't leave. He wanted them to stay there and work for Mexico. Did the school make it? It did for a few years. I guess I taught there six years, but I think ultimately it was absorbed into maybe the University of Monterey, another, another institution of higher learning. It was very expensive. He was pretty much footing the bill for the students, but many of them went on to fantastic careers. I know some did, ended up doing graduate work beyond that at Harvard because I wrote recommendation letters for them. And they all have that spirit of free enterprise and the sense they can make a difference in the world. By the way, you mentioned the Wall Street Journal. It, you've written how many pieces in the last couple of years? Well, I just happen to know um, in the last two years, 15, and I think almost always the lead op-ed, which I appreciate very much. And who first said to you, yes? Well, through the years prior to that, maybe once or twice a year, it would be the person in charge of the editorial page. Um, is that Paul Jago? Or he, is he is higher than that. He has a higher title. Um, um, the man is Robert Pollock, and his, uh, his partner is Howard Dickman. They run the page now. And um, I started getting a, just a little email. Do you have anything to say on this? And I think the first few times, now this is because my issue. I'd written a book called Money Meltdown back in 94. And so we went through the Mexican meltdown after that in 95, uh, Asian in 98, Russia 99. But whenever the US dollar has been going through its throes of agony, um, I would get a little inquiry. But especially a couple of years ago, a little email, what do you have to say about this? Any thoughts? Which is a dream come true when you, <laughs> you get a query. And I would say, look, you won't want it because I'm kind of a curmudgeon on this. And uh, I wish we had a neutral reserve as asset like gold, something universally recognized, something that's had constant purchasing power over centuries. I mean, this is crazy. You, you, you don't want to put this uh, as a lead op-ed on the nation's premier business newspaper. And he would write back, yep, sounds great, write it up. <laughs> and, and so I've had a chance. Um, I don't just, I, some people call me a gold bug, but it's not really that. What I'm saying is money is a tool. It's not something that's descended from heaven. And yet we live under legal tender laws of mandated money. You have to use the dollar. And I think that implies a moral contract on the part of government. If they're going to be the producers of the dollar, they better make it a good product. To be a good product, it has to fulfill those functions of medium of exchange, unit of account, and a store of value. And it has to do it honestly and with reliability and with integrity. Do they pay you to do that? Oh, the journal? Yeah. I think it's gone over the years from $150 to um, the one they ran a week or so ago, I got 600 for. So and you could asked, not make a living. And on they asked you for how many words? Um, usually 1,200. I want to go back in history again because you had this, I don't know what you'd call this relationship with Russia back then and um, with the wall coming down and oh, yeah. 20 years of Russia after. Let's, let's listen to what you had to say. I've always liked the literature, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and Pushkin and Gogol. And what I'm trying to do now is um, <laughs> I'm trying to memorize uh, A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by Solzhenitsyn. So I, I have tapes of Solzhenitsyn reciting his work. And then I have a Russian In version Russian or English? In Russian. And then I have the work in Russian, and I have it in English, and I have about four English-Russian dictionaries. And um, every morning, for an hour, uh, I start reciting what I've memorized so far, and uh, adding on to it, and working my way through the book. Um, Why? It's 
It's a great pleasure. I, I think the way you, you get a feel for a language, unfortunately, is through this exercise of memorization. So I need to hear it and read it and think about it so it has meaning to me personally to really embrace it. How long was one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich? How many pages? 109, maybe. Did you memorize it? Перерывистый звон слабо прошел сквозь стекла на мёрщие в два пальца и скоро затих. Холодно было, и надзирателю не охотовала долго рукой махать. Звон утих за окном все как, так среди ночи, когда в щука вставал к параж. Была тьма и тьма. Та попадала в окно три жёлтые фонаря, два на зоне, один внутри лагеря. Uh, <laughs> Some of it. Yeah, I have no idea uh, whether you were <laughs> right or wrong. But why were you doing that? And have you have you gone back to this? Do you still read Russian? Yes, I, I'm very interested in Dmitry Medvedev. Um, I the have new a, he's the president. president. I think he is different from Putin. I would love to see him be his own man. He's very much against corruption. He appreciates the ideal of democracy. Whether he can rise to challenge Putin when it comes to that, because I think it would have to come to that, I'll be very anxious to see. Um, but I read what he has to say virtually every day. The Russian presidential website is excellent. He has video of in English? Is it done in English? Russian and English. So that's a good way if you want to learn Russian. You can read it in both languages. You can watch the video with, with um, um, English beneath. You can get transcripts in, in English and Russian. Well, before you go any further, let me show you another clip because um, things have changed a lot since then. But here's what you were doing back then at your home out um, an hour from Washington. We. Um, contracted with a gentleman who had set up a satellite system uh, for Colombia to listen in on Soviet television. We, we set up the same operation at our house. And it involves a big dish and a uh, little computer. And since the Soviet satellite is not uh, geostationary, and, and I am not, I don't know anything about these things except what was explained to me, but the Soviet satellite keeps moving. So the trick to latch onto it is to get a system that can follow it and track it. So our, our dish now, wired to this computer, um, does a little search about every eight minutes, figures out which is the strongest direction, the strongest signal, and locks onto that and follows that for a little while. In the meantime, feeds through. And uh, in my office set up in the house, I can watch um, color Soviet television from about uh, 4.30 in the afternoon to about 7.30 in the morning. Uh, that comes out of Vladivostok, and then I get live Soviet radio straight out of Moscow all day long. So I, it's a pleasure for me to hear the language. I enjoy that. Uh, I don't pretend to understand all of it, but um, I can get some of it. And uh, every once in a while, there's something interesting that comes on the news. <laughs> what happened to that system at your home? I, I presume um, the people who bought our house dismantled it. Because, I mean, this was a great big dish. One time, a uh, military helicopter <laughs> just stayed near it, I'm sure taking pictures. As I understood at one time that um, there were only three such setups, and one was at NSA, and one was at CIA, and we had one. <laughs> so but these days, you, can, um, you don't have to intercept Russian broadcasts, which is, which is great. Um, but that's interesting. Yeah, that was a real indulgence. My husband let me get that. And I really did, I loved to listen um, at a certain time every day. They would go live to Red Square and play the Soviet anthem. And that came out of World War II when they would try to reassure people by radio that the country was still there. And it actually is a beautiful anthem, and of course it was thrown out when the Soviet Union ended, but it was brought back with different words. 
and I have to say it still is great music, but that's what you can hear now. I listen to Voice of Russia with earphones now at my computer live. If you live in Northern Virginia, you can watch 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Russia Today, a oh, full-time right. television network in English with people that sound almost American, in some cases they might be, or British, yeah. as anchor people. Yeah. Have you seen this, and why are they doing this? Well, that is, Russia Today is a state-controlled broadcast. It looks a lot like our American television. News. Oh, I think they actually probably tried to copy Fox News. Um, because it's, it just, it just happens to be um, state run. And you will find in, in many cases, similar type stories, at least the old Pravda approach under the Soviet Union was to highlight whatever was the worst thing that happened in the U.S. So if we had an, a natural disaster or something embarrassing politically or socially uh, catastrophic, someone walks into a school and shoots 10 people, boy, that would be on the news. That's, and, and they still tend to highlight that. They ran a huge feature last week on Russia Today explaining why, and this is just so irritating, 9-11 um, uh, was... Um, faked and the U.S. knew it and I mean just these incendiary accusations and they do it as investigative journalism. Well this Russia Today is part of a package of 10 channels that is supported by the state of Virginia and it's on a public television station. I love that we can choose to watch those things. I found that the most useful thing to me at the time I was working on the Soviet Union when they were very secretive was to have access to state controlled modes of information. It doesn't mean you can't learn a lot from that. You can learn a lot. Uh, I go first to Voice of Russia, which is also state controlled, and often look at Russia Today, which is sort of, as I say, the zippy version of what the state wants you to hear. And they will even throw in stories that are sort of critical of Russia, I think, to make it look like they're not um, preordained from the government. So they do try to do that. But um, no, I'm, I'm happy. I think those, those stations should be available. You can learn a lot by the way a government wants to present itself. The difference is you should also be listening to Radio uh, Echo Moskvi and some of the very few um, uh, media outlets out of Russia that are genuinely free. It's, it's the competitive media that gives you a chance to make for you to decide to hear the news and then you to decide what's really happening. You were talking in your book uh, that we talked about 20 years ago about the military and, and the money that Soviet Union, all their focus was on the military. 20 years later, this country spends $700 billion in the new budget on defense. And you can hear people say that it's all the rest of the world's military combined doesn't add up to $700 billion. Why are we now in the position of still being this strong military country, and do you believe we should be? Well, just to put it in perspective, that's still about 4% of our gross domestic product. And Russia, in the Soviet Union in its final days, was probably devoting over 20%, maybe 30% of its gross domestic product to the military. I mean, it was definitely a priority over everything else. Um, in this country, people don't like it to go above about four four percent. So, um, but but to your larger question of why does the U.S. have to bear the burden, I don't think um, I don't think Americans are warmongers. I think we sort of just shrug our shoulders and say somebody somebody has to do it. I think we would love it if NATO would take on more of the burden, but in the end, we find that. Um, the U.S. ends up looking, or the rest of the world ends up looking to the U.S. to to be the force for security. It's too bad. It's it's an awful burden, and I I think it's um, I think the American people are generous with their people and with their treasure to support it because I think most of the things we do aren't just necessarily to help ourselves. I think they're to help other countries. So, in the very few minutes we have left, uh, what would you tell? this president or anybody else that's responsible for the future, how to get out of this mess? 
Out of Afghanistan? No, nope. out of the financial mess we're in. Oh. <laughs> well, first I think you go back to the source of wealth in this country, which is private business. And I think you change your attitude and start saying we overtax people, we overburden with regulatory requirements, we do not support entrepreneurs and um, and we don't give them sound money, money that doesn't inflate, money that doesn't put them into higher tax brackets than they deserve. But what do you say to those that criticize the fact that the regulators were didn't do their job in the last couple of years? I, I think that's totally misplaced, totally misplaced. Um, I am so tired of the criticism of this was even among Republicans, of Wall Street greed or predatory lending. I think government had much more to do with the financial crisis because government interjected itself into the private market. When government distorted the, the risk of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac securities by sort of winking and saying these are guaranteed, and then allowed those to be sold and resold and derivatives, which are just these same kind of financial bets, that multiplied by, by 30 times over the leverage of that small group of bad risk subprime mortgages. It was the government intervention in all that. I mean, let's face it, finance and banking are the most heavily regulated industries we have. You can't, you can't regulate um, a distortion of, of markets. And, and to suggest that people were greedy because they were pursuing profits legally, it was legal to make a profit by selling derivatives, selling them 10 times over. It was perfectly legal, but why have an incentive system that makes it more profitable to write up this complex financial instrument that's a bet of whether the European Central Bank will move on interest rates or the Fed, and they both keep their deliberations secret, or whether this currency will rise or fall relative to that currency instead of having one unit of account and not playing games with money, why would you set up an incentive system that rewards people for betting on so-called investments that have nothing productive associated with them versus people who make things or furnish real services? They're saddled with having to pay when a system like that built on financial air collapses. So I blame leaders for not giving capitalism a sound monetary foundation and that would have provided the stable financial atmosphere for carrying out productive capitalism. At a time, how much of your time do you spend on the National Endowment for Democracy? Um, we have four meetings a year. I, over, I review our projects, so I would say I probably spend 20% uh, of my time what do you do the, to that. We don't have much time to go over, but 80% of the time... I think about international monetary reform, write about it, work on um, written projects. I'm going to be at the Cato Institute Monetary. It's their 27th annual monetary conference uh, in a week or so. Another book? Um, I'm not working... Well, I'm working on a book completely different. <laughs> it's more on a religious theme and it's fiction. So. Judy Shelton, <laughs> on that note, we thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Brian. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. Next week on Q&A, we talk.